Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson. So Bill Bryson is a sort of humorous travel writer. I've read a bunch of his books now. This is actually the second book of his featuring his friend Katz. Uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts on rating at the end. So, Dane reads... The longest continuous footpath in the world, the Appalachian Trail, stretches along the east coast of the United States, from Georgia to Maine, through some of the most arresting and celebrated landscapes in America. At the age of 44, in the company of his friend Stephen Katz, last seen in the best-selling Neither Here Nor There, Bill Bryson sets off to hike through the vast tangled woods which have been frightening sensible people for 300 years. Ahead lay almost 2,200 miles of remote mountain wilderness filled with bears, moose, bobcats, rattlesnakes, poisonous plants, disease-bearing ticks, the occasional chuckling murderer and, perhaps most alarming of all, people whose favourite pastime is discussing the relative merits of the external frame backpack. Facing savage weather, merciless insects, unreliable maps, and a fickle companion whose profoundest wish was to go to a motel and watch The X-Files, Bryson gamely struggled through the wilderness to achieve a lifetime's ambition, not to die outdoors. So I was particularly keen to get to this one because one of my colleagues, a client, uh, shout out to Corey if she's watching, which she probably isn't, um, but she lives in Appalachia and is actually writing a book about uh, kind of some App Appalachian history. So it's kind of cool to get to experience it through, through travel writing, you know? So here he talks about how to tackle being attacked by a bear. He says, So let us imagine that a bear does go for us out in the wilds. What are we to do? Interestingly, the advised stratagems are exactly opposite for grizzly and black bear. With a grizzly, you should make for a tall tree, since grizzlies aren't much for climbing. If a tree is not available, then you should back off slowly, avoiding direct eye contact. All the books tell you that if the grizzly comes for you, on no account should you run. This is the sort of advice you get from someone who is sitting at a keyboard when he gives it. Take it from me, if you are in an open space with no weapons and a grizzly comes for you, run. You may as well. If nothing else, it will give you something to do with the last seven seconds of your life. However, when the grizzly overtakes you, as it most assuredly will, you should fall to the ground and play dead. A grizzly may chew on a limp form for a minute or two, but generally will lose interest and shuffle off. With black bears, however, playing dead is futile since they will continue chewing on you until you are considerably past caring. It is also foolish to climb a tree, because black bears are adroit climbers and, as Herrera dryly notes, you will simply end up fighting the bear in a tree. I've heard that the, what you're supposed to do is back that backing away without making eye contact thing and you slowly remove clothes and drop it to the floor and they'll stop to sniff each item of clothing that you drop. I don't know whether that's accurate though. And he talks about, he says, what would I do if four bears came into my camp? And he says, why, I would die of course. Literally shit myself lifeless. I would blow my sphincter out of my backside like one of those unrolling paper streamers you get at children's parties. I dare say it would even give a merry toot and bleed to a messy death in my sleeping bag. So I just thought this was some cool stuff about the original vision behind the Appalachian Trail and where it is today. All 2,100 miles of the trail, as well as side trails, footbridges, signs, blazes and shelters, are impeccably maintained by volunteers. Indeed, the Appalachian Trail is said to be the largest volunteer-run undertaking on the planet. It remains gloriously free of commercialism. The Appalachian Trail Conference didn't hire its first paid employee until 1968, and retains the air of a friendly, accessible, well-intentioned outfit. The AT is no longer the longest long-distance footpath in the world. The Pacific Crest and Continental Divide trails, both out west, are slightly longer, but it will always be the first and greatest. It has a lot of friends. It deserves. So Katz has uh, found a waitress that he's flirting with, and he says, you know what I look for in a female these days? A heartbeat and a full set of limbs. And that's just my starting point, you understand? I'm prepared to compromise on the limb. They also meet this woman on the trail who's very annoying, Mar uh, very annoying. she's called Mary Ellen, and I just like this little start. Um, so what's your star sign, said Mary Ellen. Cunnilingus, Katz answered, and looked profoundly unhappy. She looked at him. I don't know that one. She made an I'll be darned frown and said, I thought I knew them all. Mine's Libra. She turned to me. What's yours? I don't know. I tried to think of something. Necrophilia. I don't know that one either. Say, are you guys having me on? Yeah. He's talking about bears again. He says, there's one recorded instance of a woman smearing honey on her toddler's fingers so that the bear would lick it off for the video camera. Failing to understand this, the bear ate the baby's hand. Yum. And they go to see Gatlinburg and he says, I was particularly eager to have a look at Gatlinburg because I'd read about it in a wonderful book called The Lost Continent, which is another one of Bryson's books. And he kind of quotes himself as well. And then he explains how it's changed, which I thought was really interesting. And he talks about some of the people they meet on the trail. So he says here, uh, One afternoon, I met a man who had been section hiking for 25 years with a bicycle and a car. Each morning, he would drop the bike at a finishing point 10 miles or so down the trail, drive the car back to the start, hike between the two, and cycle back to his car. 
He did this for two weeks every April and figured he had an about another 20 years to go. So he says uh, on the fourth night he, he finished his only book and was worried he'd have nothing to do except to lie in the, way, in the light and listen to cats snoring. And then he found that um, somebody had left a Graham Greene novel behind. Um, which is good, because I like Graham Greene, cracking author. Alright, so this is alarming here. I'm going to just read this out in full to start of chapter 11. Every 20 minutes on the Appalachian Trail, Cats and I walked further than the average American walks in a week. For 93% of all trips outside the home, for whatever distance or whatever purpose, Americans now get in a car. That's ridiculous. When we moved to the States, one of the things we wanted was to live in a town where we could walk to the shops and post office and library. We found such a place in Hanover, New Hampshire. It's a small, pleasant college town with a big green, leafy residential streets, an old-fashioned main street. Nearly everyone in town is within an easy level walk of the centre, and yet almost no one walks anywhere, ever, for anything. I have a neighbour who drives 800 yards to work. I know another, a perfectly fit woman, who will drive 100 yards to pick up her child from a friend's house. When school lets out here, virtually every child, except for four bitching kids with English acts, gets picked up and driven from a few hundred yards to three quarters of a mile home. Those who live further away get a bus. Most of the children 16 years or older have their own cars. That's ridiculous too. On average, the total walking of an American these days, that's walking of all types, from car to office, from office to car, around the supermarket and shopping malls, adds up to 1.4 miles a week barely 350 yards a day. So Katz gets into some trouble with a woman's boy, uh, husband and um, he asks Bryson to come up with a plan and Bryson gives him one. He goes, have you got a better one? No, but I didn't go to college for four years. Stephen, I didn't study how to save your ass in Waynesboro. I majored in political science. If your problem was to do with proportional representation in Switzerland, I might be able to help you. And then we get this, uh, I could be dead in a minute, he said grimly, then clutch my forearm. Look, if I get shot, do me a favor. Call my brother and tell him there's $10,000 buried in a coffee can under his front lawn. You buried $10,000 under your brother's front lawn? No, of course not, but he's a little prick and it would serve him right. Let's go. And they meet some travelers who are super annoying and so Katz gets them back by stealing uh, their shoelaces. And I enjoy this because um, this is kind of the realities of being an author and also it's a reference to OJ Simpson and uh, me and my other half were watching a BuzzFeed Unsolved episode about that the other day. I had to go off for a month to do other things, principally try to persuade Americans to buy a book of mine even though it had nothing to do with effortless weight loss, running with the wolves, thriving in an age of anxiety or the OJ Simpson trial. Even so it sold over 60 copies. And here we get a little bit about Stonewall Jackson, I just thought this was interesting. Now Stonewall Jackson is a man worth taking an interest in. Few people in history have achieved greater fame in a shorter period with less useful activity in the brain box than General Thomas J. Jackson. His idiosyncrasies were legendary. He was hopelessly, but inventively, hypochondrical. One of his more engaging physiological beliefs was that one arm was bigger than the other and in consequence he always walked and rode with that arm held straight up so that his blood would drain into his body. He was a champion sleeper. More than once he fell asleep at the dinner table with food in his mouth. At the Battle of White Oak Swamp, his lieutenants found it all but impossible to rouse him and lifted him, insensible, onto his horse where he continued to slumber while shells exploded around him. His obtuseness was feigned. Once when a celebrated singer sang Dixie for him and his officers, then asked if he had any special requests, he told her he had just one. Would she sing Dixie for him? He showed excessive zeal in recording captured goods and would defend them at all costs. His list of material liberated from the Union Army during the 1862 Shenandoah campaign included six handkerchiefs, two and three quarter dozen neckties, and one bottle of red ink. He constantly drove his superiors, fellow commanders, and junior officers to enraged frustration, partly by repeatedly disobeying instructions and partly by his paranoid habit of refusing to divulge his strategies, such as they were, to anyone. One officer under his command was ordered to withdraw from the town of Gordonville, where he was on the brink of a signal victory, and march at the double to Staunton. Arriving in Staunton, he found fresh orders to go at once to Mount Crawford. There, he was told to return to Gordonsville. He's talking about mines. He says, between 1870 and the outbreak of the First World War, 50,000 people died in American mines. And the great irony of anthracite is that, tough as it is to light, once you get it lit, it's nearly impossible to put out. Stories of uncontrolled mine fires are legion in eastern Pennsylvania. One fire at La Haye began in 1850 and didn't burn itself until the Great Depression, 80 years after it started. He talks about the strange books that you find in thrift shops with titles like Home Drainage Encyclopedia Volume 1 and Not If You Can Hear Me, Living With A Humor Vegetable. That's very relatable if you, like me, like to go shopping in charity shops. And Katz tells him a joke, he says, uh, girlfriend and boyfriend are talking. The girlfriend says to the boyfriend, Jimmy, how do you spell paedophilia? The boyfriend looks at her in amazement. Gosh, honey, he says, that's an awfully big word for an eight-year-old. 
<laughs> All right, so a walk in the woods by Bill Bryson. Cracking travel writing. It was nice to have cats back as well. Uh, Bryson didn't walk the full length of the trail because he's not mental, but he did walk a decent chunk of it, and it was great to sort of discover a lot of the different places that he went through. There's some really nice uh, like nature writing and stuff as well in terms of like the wildlife that they discover along the way. Very, very funny. Overall, I gave a walk in the woods by Bill Bryson a very strong four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.